morning. How you doing today? Good. Are you glad to be here? Yeah, me too. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah uh, chapter 40, that great chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah 40. And while you're turning there, let me ask you something. Uh, do you ever feel like the enjoyment of Christmas completely hinges on what you do? Uh, what you need to do, what you need to get done, all of the preparations that you need to get in place in order to have a great celebration. You ever feel that way? Uh, Believe it or not, one of my least favorite things to do in the world is to look back on messages that I've preached and shared with you all. Uh, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to take a look at yourself speaking in front of people or uh, sharing a message, public speaking, but it's always painful uh, to go back and to look at. And one of the things that makes it painful beyond the uh, nonverbal aspects of delivering a message, but one of the things that makes it painful for me is that oftentimes I cringe and I wince a little bit and I say to myself, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe that I shared that. And sometimes I feel like, Lord, I owe you an apology and I owe the people of God an apology. Uh, let me explain it this way. I shared this a little bit about a year ago, last Advent, and uh, this is where I struggle because I think as I look back at past Advent messages that my message to you has been something like this. I've said something like this. For, for many of us, this is a hectic time of year, and you know you need to slow down and make sure you don't miss the reason for the season, which of course is all about Jesus. Uh, slow down and consider what Jesus means for you and for your life and for our world, and whatever you do, make sure you don't get swept up into Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all of this crass consumerism that's in our culture. Keep the focus on Jesus. I think I've shared something like that probably more than once. Now that's good advice. We always need to slow down, we always need to think about Jesus. You can't go wrong with that. But what our hearts long for as we move from Advent into Christmas, what our hearts really desire more than anything is good news. Not just good advice, but good news. What my heart wants most is not a list of things that I have to do in order to get Christmas right. What my heart needs most is a message of hope about what God has done through Jesus Christ in order to make the world right. What I need to hear as Christmas approaches is not another do message, D-O, but what I need to hear is done, D-O-N-E, that God has done it. A pastor Todd Wilson tells a story about when a young mother came up to him following a Christmas service, a Christmas sermon he preached, and she said to him, I need to hear a message that does not depend on me doing one more thing to make Christmas season a success. A shopping or cooking or caring for kids or finishing the semester at school, wrapping presents, attending parties, keeping house, a traveling across the country to be with family, and oh, making sure that I keep my focus on Jesus. Got it. She said, what I need most is a message that does not hinge on me doing one more thing as if it's my action or thought that makes Christmas real. What I want most is a message of hope that God's gift of Jesus has already transformed the world whether I'm conscious of it or not. Now, when I hear this woman's story, it causes me, as a pastor, as somebody who enjoys preaching, it causes me to say, ouch. If you can't say amen, say ouch. And as I think about some of the things that I've preached in years past, how often have my messages been do messages? Versus done. Now there's a place for do messages, but we can only do because of what Christ has already done. Uh, we need to begin with the done. And I've come to see that if all I preach is a steady diet of do good, try harder sermons, it doesn't cause you all to do good and try harder. You know what it does? 
It causes you to give up. Okay, it, it exhausts you. Uh, spiritually exhaust you. So this Advent season, I want to take these words, these wise, wise words of this young mother to heart and not add to your to-do list, but I would like to encourage you this morning with a message that's a done message about what God has done and about what God will do. So let's look at Isaiah 40 where we see the gospel for the people living in Isaiah's day and age. Isaiah 40 is about what God has done and about what God will do. Isaiah 40 marks a major turning point in the book of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 39 deal with the Assyrian invasion. Okay, the Assyrian threat. Then chapters 40 through 66 deal with the Babylonian threat and the Babylonian invasion. Now when Isaiah is writing and he transitions from chapter 39 to 40, he transitions in chapter 40 to 100 years into the future, okay? He's speaking to people who will be in exile in Babylon. God is foretelling the Babylonian invasion and how they're gonna be in exile in Babylon, and so Isaiah is looking into the future and he's writing to encourage the exiles, to encourage people who are not born yet with what God will do for his people, how he will come to his people, how he will rescue his people, how he will deliver his people and bring them back into the land. Based on the good news of what God will do, Isaiah announces, look at chapter 40 in verse one, he says, comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Yes, God will judge their sin, but he also has a future filled with comfort and hope for his people. He will never cast off his people. God is coming to his people, but we must prepare the way by repenting of our sins. Uh, The voice of John the Baptist echoes down through the ages to us this morning, calling us from Isaiah 40 to repent of our sins, to remove every obstacle that would get in the way, every crooked path that would hinder the advent, the coming of God into our hearts and into our homes. We're called to build a straight shot highway into our hearts. Just like we talked about last week, Uh, just like the example I gave you was what we call the gun barrel here in Colorado. You ever been on it from Sawatch to Monta Vista? And the San Luis Valley has, I think it's like 35 miles where it's just straight as an arrow without any turns. It's just flat. And it's the same way. We need to build a super highway into our hearts for our God. Isaiah 40, and look at verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And as we prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord, we look to verse five. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now this is an amazing promise. This is speaking of the advent of our God. God is going to come and rescue his people. He's going to reveal his glory and all people, Isaiah says, shall see it together. But if you had been forcibly relocated from Jerusalem to Babylon, if you were living far from home, far from everything that made your life meaningful and comfortable and familiar, you would probably think to yourself if you were one of those exiles, you know, Jerusalem lies in shambles, Our leaders are in chains. How in the world is this going to happen? I would like to believe it, but honestly, I don't see it. So here in verse six, God begins to speak to these people. God speaks comforting promises to his people to still their hearts and to calm their fears. Look at verse six. A voice says, cry. Okay, this is the voice of God here. A voice says cry, and I said, this is Isaiah speaking. Isaiah says, what shall I cry? And he says, Isaiah, say this to my people. All flesh is like grass, and all its beauty is like the flower 
of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of our Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass, but the word of our God stands forever. Now what is God saying here? He's saying, my my rule and reign does not depend on you. I've made promises, and no matter how improbable they may seem to you at the moment, I am going to keep my word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now this past week as I was studying Advent, I came across a quote that was supposed to be an encouraging quote about Advent, but I found it actually to be quite discouraging. Uh, uh, Someone said, and I won't share their name with you, but someone said, it is while waiting for the coming reign of God, Advent after Advent after Advent, that we come to realize that its coming depends on us. Now at first glance, that that sounds pretty, pretty good. We're Americans, if it's going to be, it's up to me, right? If it's gonna happen, it's up to me. But look a little deeper and think about it a little deeper and it's really bad news. God's reign depends on us. Uh, If that's true, we're in deep trouble. And that's exactly Isaiah's point to these people who are living in exile, who are saying, I see what you're promising here, God, but I don't see it happening. And Isaiah is saying to them, his coming and the fulfillment of these promises does not depend on you. And Babylon, as mighty as Babylon might seem, cannot stand in God's way. Babylon is weak, Israel is weak, all people are weak. Only God is strong forever. People and nations and armies are temporary. People and nations and armies are just like green grass. Green for a season, then it turns brown, just like wildflowers, beautiful wildflowers. Yes, but they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. But the word of our God, all of his promises stand forever. He is the king of the ages and what he has promised is certain. He will comfort you, he will pardon you, he will forgive your sins, he will rescue you, he will redeem you, and he's going to reveal his glory to you. And you know what, nothing can stop him. Because the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, his promises stand forever. Now why does the grass wither and the flower fade? Because look at verse seven. The breath of our God blows on them. Okay, the same creative breath that breathed life into Adam is the same breath that is used to judge people and to judge nations. And he tears down anyone who stands in his way, kings and kingdoms. Surely all people are like grass. Uh, Friends, even if we're good, even if we were good and we're not, uh, none of us are good in the way that God is good. Uh, None of us live long enough to make an everlasting impact. Uh, Just look at Time Magazine, their 100 most influential people. They have those lists, and just, just go back two or three years ago, Uh, four years ago, and look at the list of the most influential people in our world. Flip through that magazine, go back a few years, and you know what, you'll find people that you don't even recognize anymore. 25, 30% of them will be dead and gone in Time Magazine. People who are the most powerful, influential trendsetters of the day and age, but they have faded into obscurity like flowers. Scorched by the hot summer sun. You can't count on people is what Isaiah is saying, but he's saying you can count on God. You can count on his word because the grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. God's promises do not depend on us. They depend on God and his word and God's word always stands. He watches over his word, the Bible says, very carefully to perform it, to keep it. Not a single word, not a single promise will ever fall to the ground. God never slips off his throne. His hand never, ever comes off the rudder of history. He's never tired. He never is worn out. I mean, really, if you think about it, you cannot count on anyone else in life with certainty. Uh, You can't. Why? Because their beauty is like the green grass. Their beauty is like the beautiful flowers that's there for a moment then gone forever. 
The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, the only thing that we can rely on with absolute certainty is God and what he has promised. God was saying to his exiles, I know Babylon is strong, but the permanence of my word over and against all the might of people and nations guarantees against any deviation from the plan. My plan is to come to you. My plan is to rescue you. My plan is to forgive your sins. My plan is to bring you back into the land. And because I have promised it, it's certain. Look at verse 5. The very end. What does it say? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When God promises it, uh, it's settled. You've, maybe you've seen the old bumper sticker. I haven't seen it in some years now, but it says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's wrong. God says it, that settles it. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's going to come to pass. For us, the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but to water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. God says it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sin it. The Lord Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, an iota, a dot, that would be like a period or a comma. If you can think of the smallest marks of punctuation in the English language, Jesus is saying, down to the meticulous detail, God is watching over his promises and they never fail. The permanence of God's word over and against frail humanity guarantees against any deviation from the plan of God. He has promised to come to his people in Babylon to rescue them, to bring them back into the land and you know what, he did it. He promised the first coming of the Lord Jesus, and he did it, and he's promised the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will do it. It is more certain than death. It is more certain than taxes. It is more certain than the sun going down tonight. Jesus Christ is coming again. Why? Because he's promised. Our deliverance is coming, and we will dwell with God in a new heavens and a new earth. These promises are absolutely certain. Why? Because the grass withers. The flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Once upon a time in a land, before there were cars, or modern machines, a time when horses and carriages and wagons were common, and dirt roads. Uh, There was a blacksmith with a shop, and he had a large, heavy worn out anvil. And one day there was a little boy who came in from the farm who had never left the farm. This is his first time going to town with his dad. And everything was brand new. It was a new world to the little boy. And as he walked through town with his father, on this unpaved main street, he heard a loud clang, clang, clang. And he said to his father, what, what is that, dad? And his father said, come on over here, son, and I'll show you. He took his son over to the door of a blacksmith's shop, okay? And there the boy saw a huge man with huge arms, and he had a huge, heavy hammer with a long handle with a large head on it, swinging it up into the air like he was going to bring it down like an ax trying to chop down a tree. But then it would come crashing down on a glowing piece of metal on top of the anvil, And he hit the anvil so hard that every time he hit it, the little boy would wince because of the powerful collision. And his father explained to him that it was the blacksmith who made all kinds of metal pieces for wagons and carriages and plows and tools and horseshoes. But the little boy was 
fixed on one thing, the conflict between the heavy hammer and the metal anvil. Uh, They met each other with such a loud sound and such a force that he thought to himself, surely this anvil cannot last long. And the big, strong blacksmith paused for a moment to catch his breath, and he looked over and he saw the young boy staring and standing in the doorway. And the little boy said to him, aren't you going to break that thing? Pointing to the anvil. But the blacksmith smiled and said, son, this anvil is 500 years old, and it's worn out hundreds of hammers. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible is God's word. And it is the anvil that has worn out thousands of hammers. In every generation, new and heavy hammers are forged against the truth of God's word. Harder and harder hammers of doubt and skepticism and unbelief relentlessly pound away generation after generation at the word of God. Every generation has its unique hammers, but they all boil down to this. Has God really said? Has God really promised? Is it really going to happen? Can we really trust what God has said? And Isaiah is saying, yes, all of God's promises are trustworthy and true, that the permanence of God's word guarantees against any deviation from his plan, whether we're speaking about his plan to deliver the exiles from Babylon, or his plan to send Jesus the first time, or his plan to send the Lord Jesus the second time. His words are a sure foundation for life and for death. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And so on this third Sunday of Advent, because of all of these promises that are trustworthy and true, I believe the Holy Spirit is challenging us in two specific ways. First of all, there's a challenge to build our lives upon the Word of God, not upon fads and trends. Our culture, if anything characterizes our culture, it's characterized by fads and fashions and trends. Certain ways of thinking conventional wisdom that we latch onto and we have a tendency to build our lives around. We should not build our lives on these fads and trends but upon the word of God. Why? Because we don't want to spend our lives chasing these beautiful yet translucent bubbles that when you touch them, what happens? They pop, right? There's no substance behind them. And there are all types of remedies, all types of schemes and hopes that have nothing to do with the unfailing word of God. And we hear them on TV, we hear them on the radio, we see them in self-help books on the end cap at Costco, and what do all of these fads and trends and fashions have in common in their thinking? All of them are man-centered solutions that have nothing to do with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are solutions that ignore sin and salvation, repentance, forgiveness, heaven, and hell. They are man-centered philosophies of life that seek happiness through self-actualization rather than through loving God, loving others, and making disciples. What God has called us to do. And you know what? As promising as these fads, fashions, and trends may be, guess what? They're going to be replaced by other fads, fashions, and trends in just a few years. It used to be that that type of thing happened every 10 years or 15 years, but it feels like it happens every couple of years now. If the foundation of your life is built upon psychology and psychiatry and philosophy and economics and evolution and politics and pop culture, then you're setting yourself up for disillusionment. Why? Because all of these fads are going to shift in just a few years. And what are you going to be left with? Disillusionment, unfulfilled lives. No fountain of youth, no utopia, no hope and comfort in the face of death, no hope. You see, as followers of the Lord Jesus, we cannot pay more attention to what Jordan Peterson and Brene Brown say than what the Word of God says. And you know, my fear is that for many people that they elevate some of these experts up to the same level as the Word of God. 
But in the Word of God, we don't have any mixture of truth and error. Every single word is true. Every promise is true. So the question is, what are you building your life on? What are you building your life on? Are, are, are you learning the promises of God and leaning on the promises of God? Herbert, Herbert Lockyer wrote a book called All the Promises of the Bible, and he went through it and he found 8,000 promises. Okay, there's another Bible scholar that he found 7,000 some promises, seven to 8,000 promises, depending on how you categorize it. But think about it, there are thousands of promises in the Bible right now that you can build your life on. Whatever you're going through right now, there is a promise there to guide your steps and to bring comfort to your soul. And all of these promises, unlike the teachings of Dr. Phil and Oprah and Rob Bell and other experts, they will never shift. They will never change, why? Because every single word is true. When the Bible speaks about sin and salvation, when it speaks about judgment, when it speaks about eternity and redemption, relationships and marriage and sexuality and families and singleness and vocation and money and on and on it goes, it always speaks the truth. So how are you building your life on the enduring word of God? I want to encourage you to look deep into this book. Uh, I think it was Spurgeon who said, you know, we can visit many books, but we need to live in the Bible. Okay, we, we need to live in the Bible. We need to study it. We need to read through it. We need to look at what God has promised. We need to allow the Word of God to shape the decisions that we make. We need to delight in the Word. And secondly, because God's Word stands forever, we need to be comforted by the promise of his return. The Bible promises a lot of things, at least 7,000 things. Okay, but this Advent season, I believe one promise rises up a little higher than the others, and that's the return of Jesus. Jesus is coming again. He came the first time to bear the cross, and he comes the second time to wear the crown. He will come again just as he has promised. What's the very last promise in the Bible? Take a look at Revelation 22.20. The very last promise in the Bible, what does it say? Find that promise. Whoever gets there first, just shout it out. Verse 20, Revelation 22, 20. What does it say? Surely I am coming soon. Thank you. <laughs> coming quickly. Jesus is coming again. You know, over my years as a pastor, I've come to see that the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, are really difficult times for many people. These times, which really should be a celebration, are often signals to us that everything isn't as they should be in our lives. Uh, maybe you don't have a table to sit at, or maybe if you have a table to sit at, you don't have anybody to feast with. Maybe it's too painful to sit at that table because of people who are no longer there. Maybe a loved one or a spouse or a good friend that you have lost. Maybe it's impossible to celebrate because there's alienation in your life with somebody else that you used to be close to. You've had a falling out and you don't know how to repair the damage in order to move forward. But listen, the promise of Jesus' return gives us strength to do hard things like celebrating even when we have pain and difficulty in our lives. It gives us the strength to do things like taking the initiative to be reconciled, even when we don't feel like it's our fault, even when we don't feel like we should be the one approaching the other person. Because Jesus is coming again and will make all things right, we can acknowledge the darkness while optimistically leaning into the future. Because the second coming of Jesus is absolutely certain. We can live with love, hope, peace, and joy even when everything in our lives isn't as we wish it would be. Let, let me ask you, if you believe that Jesus is returning again, what is something that you need to do differently? Maybe a different way you need to think. Uh, maybe you're one of those people who's trying to get all of your good things here and now. 
You're chasing after the almighty dollar. You're chasing after a promotion. And because Jesus is returning, I think the Word of God would ask you, if we believe Jesus is returning, if we believe that so much more is coming later, can't we learn to live with a little bit less here and now and to enjoy that? Now, some of us, especially middle-aged men, are living with a smoldering resentment because life hasn't turned out for us the way we thought it would. For a lot of middle-aged men, they've come to see that they're not going to get the corner office, that they're not going to get the promotion, that somebody who is younger than they are has passed them up, and you've come to see that life isn't going to turn out for you the way you would like it to turn out, and so you know what? You live with this smoldering resentment that is just beneath the surface, and guess what? Your wife and kids are paying for it. Because you get squeezed, and what happens when you get squeezed, that resentment comes out. And they're paying for it. Let me ask you, because Jesus is returning, can you not go have yourself a good man cry? You know, have you ever done that? Have yourself a good man cry over the life you hoped would be and surrender all of your hopes and dreams and ambitions to him and wash your face and embrace the life that God has given you. Can't you do that? Or perhaps you're living with some injustice in your life, something from the past that keeps you from pressing forward. Or maybe it was a nasty divorce where you were taken to the cleaners and maybe you just feel like you got the shaft. You know, you got a raw deal. Or maybe you have some physical or emotional abuse somewhere in your past from someone you trusted. I'm very sorry about that. But because Jesus is coming again, can you relinquish some of that injustice to him, trusting in him that all of those wrongs will be made right? The permanence of God's word, the certainty of his promises ensures that there will be no deviation from the plan of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Jesus has come. He will come again, and because of this, you know what? We have a living hope. We have a living hope. Let's take a moment right now to seek God's face, uh, to praise him for his promises, to download our hearts before him. And I ask you, what is God saying to you through this message, through trusting his word and believing his promises? And let's take this time of prayer and reflection to draw strength from the fact that Jesus is returning. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Lord, sanctify us. Make us like Jesus by your truth. The grass withers, the flower fades. But your word, O God, will stand forever. Every word, every promise will be fulfilled. Everything you have said is trustworthy and true. And we look to you today. God, would you allow allow us to be encouraged by the fact that This is your word, and you are fulfilling it. May we find rest in what you have done. Uh, Teach us, Lord, to look to your words and to trust in your words, even when they don't seem probable. Help us to gather strength from the word. And God, help us in these broken down circumstances of our lives. The places where we have pain, the places where we're suffering perhaps from an injustice of some type, Uh, the places, Lord, where we have open wounds, places where we're angry, the places where we're frustrated, uh, disappointed, and disillusioned. 
Uh, Help us to look to you and to find strength and joy. Because, Lord, your words are an anchor to our souls. And for that, we're grateful. Uh, Teach us to love your word, God. Teach us to look to it first. And Lord, help us to combine your promises with faith. Because you want us to respond in faith and trust and obedience. So help us, God. And God, we thank you on this third Sunday of Advent for the reality that Jesus has come and he will come again, and that changes everything. And it fills our lives with a tremendous amount of hope and a tremendous amount of joy. It is so much greater than any circumstance we might be going through. So God, give us your joy and help us to trust you in greater ways. Pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said together.